Ho, ho, ho. Let's see what old Saint Jay has got in his sack for you. Tis the season for snacking. Celebrate the holidays with Tokyo Treat, the ultimate Japanese snack box that delivers the magic of Japan straight to your doorstep. This month's theme is Very Merry Snackmas, and it's packed with exclusive and limited edition holiday treats you won't find anywhere else. From the creamy, dreamy Kit Kat white chocolate crepe, to the indulgent premium Ghana holiday chocolate truffles, to the crispy, savory sour cream and onion waffle chips, every bite is a delicious surprise, and I just love them all. I personally loved the Kit Kats and those delicious chocolate truffles, but honestly, the whole box is a festive treasure trove. Just look at how much you get in this box. It's absolutely packed. There's a booklet too so you can learn more about the snacks that you receive, as well as allergen information. And the booklet also contains a wealth of information about Japanese culture. Whether you're treating yourself or gifting it to someone special, Tokyo Treat is the perfect way to experience the flavors of Japan this holiday season without leaving your home. So what are you waiting for? Click the links below, grab your very merry Snackmas box, and don't forget to use my code for a sweet discount. Make this holiday season extra special with Tokyo Treat. Happy snacking and happy holidays. Experience the holidays like never before with Sakurako. Each box comes with 20 traditional, authentic, and artisan snacks. From delicious sweets to savory delights paired with fine Japanese teas, plus a special piece of Japanese tableware. This month's theme is Holidays in Hokkaido, a journey through Japan's northern wonderland. Inside you'll discover rich and authentic flavors like the Hokkaido Milk Manju, Honey Apple Mochi, Hokkaido Milk Danish, and the indulgent Hokkaido Strawberry Chocolate Cookie. As a special touch, each box includes a Shonzui flower dish, an elegant tableware item that adds a festive charm to your snack time. You'll not only learn about the snacks, but get to dive into the culture and stories behind them. Personally, I'm most excited about the Mount Fuji Senbei. It looks delicious, and I can't wait to enjoy it with a warm cup of Genmai Cha. Give the gift of Japan this holiday season. Whether for yourself or for a loved one, Sakurako is the perfect way to experience Japan's winter magic from the comfort of your home. Click the links below and use my code JNIGHTMARES for an exclusive discount for both Sakurako and Tokyo Treat. I just would like to thank Tokyo Tree and Sakurako for sponsoring this channel so regularly. I think they're great. So if you know a lover of Japan, or if you're a lover of Japan yourself, give them a try. And now, to set the mood for winter, join me as I share some spine-chilling, true Japanese scary stories, all from the snowy landscapes of Hokkaido, the theme of Sakurako's box this month. Hey everyone, I don't often post, but after lurking here for a while, I figured this story might fit. It's something I heard when I was working in Hokkaido a few years back, and honestly, it still creeps me out. So, if you're not familiar, back in the day there was a town in eastern Hokkaido called Yubetsu. It was a mining town, built around the coal industry. In its prime, Yubetsu was booming. They brought in loads of workers. There were some from Korea, others who were, well, let's just say, off the radar people, with no family, no history, and no place else to go. They even took in orphans when they came of working age. The thing about coal mining, though, is it's dangerous as hell. A lot of workers didn't make it out alive. Over time, more and more 
nameless gravestones started popping up. No one to mourn them. No one to even remember them. But as the world shifted from coal to oil, you bet the mine couldn't cope. They couldn't compete. The mine shut down, and with it, the town slowly emptied out. People left to find work elsewhere, and eventually, Yubetsu became a ghost town. I'm not exaggerating. Literally, no one lives there now. Here's where it gets weird. Apparently, when the town was abandoned, no one knew what to do with all those nameless gravestones. Someone thought it would be a great idea just to dump them in the river that runs through Yubetsu. I'm not superstitious, but even I can tell you that that's a really bad idea. It's just a recipe for bad vibes. After that, people started saying the whole area was cursed. Now, the town's just a shell. There's an old hospital, a cinema, and this massive smokestack that you can see from miles away. People keep reporting creepy stuff when they go there like seeing ghosts in the hospital windows or hearing voices in the abandoned cinema. And then there's the legend of the smokestack. They say if you see it upside down somehow, you'll never make it out of Yubetsu. Even the locals in Kushiro, which is the nearest town, know better than to mess with Yubetsu. It's like an unspoken rule. Just don't go there. A famous psychic Kibo Aiko once went there to investigate and flat out said, I can't handle this before noping out. That should tell you something. One of the creepiest stories I heard involved three people, two guys and a girl, who decided to go to Yubetsu for a test of courage. You know, messing around. They drove out there late at night laughing and daring each other to go into the old hospital but for some reason the guys left the girl behind in the hospital. No idea why, maybe they were just trying to prank her or something, but they drove off without her. Horrible thing to do. The next day they found her. She was still alive, but her hair had turned completely white. And she wasn't the same person anymore, she was just... gone. Mentally. Totally broken. They ended up admitting her to a psych ward. What's worse is what happened to the guys. A few weeks later, both of them died under mysterious circumstances. No one knows what caused it, but it was sudden and unexplainable. A few years ago, I went to Yubetsu for a construction project. We weren't supposed to be there at night. Overtime wasn't permitted, but one time, we lost track of time and the sun went down. You'd think a place with no electricity would be pitch black, right? But no. Yubetsu was glowing. It wasn't just the moonlight either. It was this strange dim light that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once. The air felt heavy, like the whole town was watching us. Even the guys I was working with, tough, no-nonsense types, started looking uneasy. We packed up and left as soon as we could, but I swear, something seemed to follow us out. I don't know what's going on in Yubetsu, and I don't want to find out. If you're ever in Hokkaido and someone suggests checking it out, just do yourself a favor and say no. Don't go there. Anyway, thanks for reading. Just typing this out has me looking over my shoulder. Stay safe, everyone. Living in Hokkaido comes with a unique set of rules. Some of them are obvious. Dress in layers, learn to love seafood, get used to snowbanks taller than you in winter. But one rule every local takes dead seriously? Respect the bears. You might not think of grizzlies when you picture Japan. Sure, Honshu has black bears. 
But Hokkaido? We've got the real deal. Brown bears. Grizzlies. By any other name. And they're not the shy kind that scare off easily. They're bold, territorial, and terrifyingly clever. Growing up here, you learn early that entering into the wilderness without a bear bell is like playing Russian roulette. A can of bear spray is a must-have, not an optional accessory. This story isn't mine, but it's one every Hokkaido climber hears eventually. They say it's an urban legend, but the details are too vivid to dismiss entirely. It supposedly happened a few years back to a group of university students, an outdoors club on a summer expedition. Here's what I've pieced together from the rumors, campfire retellings, message board posts, and fragments of A's journal. The only tangible record of what went down. Five students made up the party. A, the leader, level-headed, methodical, and experienced climber. B is the sub-leader, A's best friend, the more outgoing of the two. C was the quiet one, known for their endurance and calm under pressure. D, the joker of the group, always ready to lighten the mood, and E is a newbie. This was his first major climb, and he'd been brought along to break him in. A and B had organized the trip as a bonding exercise for the group. They planned a five-day trek through the Tokachi mountain range, a route that was challenging but manageable for experienced climbers. Some of the party had previously encountered a brown bear, but had escaped without injury. Don't worry if you lose track of who's who. Just remember that there are five of them, and A and B are the leaders. By all accounts, the first day was picture perfect. A promising start. The group set out under clear skies, their spirits high. The ridgeline route offered breathtaking views of the surrounding valleys, and they made good time to their first campsite. A kept things organized, dividing tasks evenly. B handled the cooking, cracking jokes as he prepared dinner. C and D set up the tent while E watched and asked questions, trying to absorb everything. That night, as they sat around the campfire, D shared a ghost story about a climber who'd gotten lost in the fog and was never seen again. Everyone laughed it off, but E seemed uneasy. A reassured him, As long as we stick to the plan, we'll be fine. They all turned in early, ready for the challenges ahead. Day 2 The next morning, the weather took a turn. Clouds gathered as they ascended, and by midday, a light drizzle had turned into steady rain. They reached the second campsite earlier than planned, and decided to hunker down. The rain and wind battered the tent all night, but inside it was cozy. They cooked on portable stoves, played cards, shared stories. Think we'll see any bears? D asked, grinning. Not if we're careful, A replied, though he couldn't help glancing at the bear bell, hanging near the tent flap. Just don't leave food out. Day two ended uneventfully, but the group would later realize that this was the last night that they'd feel safe. Day three. By dawn, the rain had stopped, but a thick fog blanketed the mountains. Visibility was barely a few meters. Looks like we're staying put, B announced. Moving in this is asking for trouble. They spent their day inside the tent, waiting for the fog to lift. By afternoon, the mood had shifted. The close quarters, damp air, and constant drip of condensation on the tent walls were wearing on everyone. E was restless, fidgeting with his gear. Maybe we should just go down. I mean, how bad can it be? Bad enough to get us lost, or worse, A said firmly. We wait. That evening, E accidentally left a pot outside after dinner. No one thought much of it until they heard light footsteps circling the tent. Is that a fox? C whispered. A grabbed a flashlight and stepped outside to chase it off. The fox darted away, but A returned looking uneasy. We need to be more careful. Foxes mean food smells, and food smells mean... They didn't need to finish the sentence. They didn't have to. Day 4. The fog didn't lift 
By now, tensions were running high. The group was frustrated, cooped up in the tent for the third day in a row. They debated pushing forward, but the risk was too great. Late that night, it came. A deep, deliberate thud against the side of the tent. Everyone froze. What was that? He whispered, his voice trembling. The answer came in the form of slow, heavy footsteps circling the tent. The sound was unmistakable. They could smell something from inside the tent. A strong, animalistic stench hit their noses. It was clear. It was a bear. The group huddled together in the center of the tent, hearts pounding. The animal sniffed around, its massive body brushing against the fabric. Then it rammed the tent with its shoulder, testing its strength. E started to sob, and D clapped a hand over his mouth. Shh, don't move, A whispered. For what felt like hours, the bear circled, sniffing and pushing against the tent. Then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it seemed to have wandered off. No one slept that night. Day 5 I woke up to the sound of bird calls. The air was heavy with the bear's musky scent. No one spoke as they packed up, moving with robotic efficiency. Midday brought another visit. The bear appeared out of the fog, a hulking shadow, and began circling the campsite again. After it circled our tent for a while, it disappeared again. In the evening, D mustered up his courage and slightly opened the tent to see if the coast was clear outside. The fog's clearing a little. A little bit of sunlight reached and remained in the area, and there were signs that the fog was clearing. Discussions were beginning. The group was divided into those who insisted they should descend immediately and those who should wait until tomorrow. The bear might still be nearby, and it was clear that if they started to descend now, they would end up in the middle of the trail with no chance to rest. The fog had not completely cleared, and in bad weather, acting hastily at night is a recipe for disaster. As the leader, A could not allow the group to descend. It is unclear whether it was a calm decision or one made in the midst of fear. Anyway, the day ended like that. No one spoke. Not only was it because of the fear, but the main reason was the party's opinions were at odds. That night, the bear circled the area, occasionally buffeting the tent. No one slept again. The journal grows fragmented after this. Each entry is shorter and more frantic. Day 6. The clear skies we hoped for yesterday were just a cruel lie. The fog is heavy. We woke up in silence, and that silence remained unbroken all morning. No one eats. We can't risk attracting the bear. But this morning, it's quiet outside. Even the smell of the creature seems to have faded. A few hours later, C announced, I'll step outside. We were all objecting. It's just to check the surrounding, C argued. The bear isn't nearby now. Reluctantly, A gave permission on the condition that he came back immediately. C disappeared into the fog. B turned on A, accusing A of being reckless, but eventually fell silent. Then we heard footsteps. Hoping it was C returning, we moved to open the tent, but the smell of the beast stopped us cold. Where's C? D asked, his voice trembling. The bear's breathing was harsher, heavier than before. A sudden, violent impact shook the tent. We pressed together, too terrified to scream. The bear circled outside for what felt like an eternity before settling. Its footsteps faded, but the stench lingered. We didn't move the entire day. C never came back. Was he attacked? Day 7. The fog is still thick. By morning, the bear seemed to have left, likely searching for food. After a tense silence, E snapped. Eyes bloodshot from the lack of sleep. Voice frantic, E declared, I'm heading down the mountain. I'm heading down the mountain. We tried to stop him, but he wouldn't listen. I'll get help. Wait here, he insisted, grabbing his pack and vanishing into the fog. The five of us were now three. A, B, and D. While the bear was gone, we ate whatever we could. Energy bars, ration packs. No one spoke, though. Time passed slowly. 
Around midday I peeked outside, the fog still refused to clear, and by dusk, the bear had returned. Huddled in the center of the tent, we braced ourselves against its assaults. Sweating from the damp air, shaking with fear, we managed to stay silent. Did E make it down safely? Day 8. The fog has not lifted. By morning, the bear was gone. No one suggested leaving at this point. To distract myself, I wrote in this diary. I wanted to take it home with me. But at around 2 p.m., B snapped. It all started with laughter, high and shrill. And then he screamed, a piercing sound before bolting out of the tent, empty-handed, still laughing. We watched him vanish into the fog, his laughter echoing until it faded. No one tried to stop him. His laughter would only further invite the bear. We have to survive. D quietly zipped the tent shut, and for the first time in a while, spoke. He's gone. That night, the bear returned. D and I clung to each other, waiting for dawn. Day 9. The fog is dense again. The bear lingered near us all morning, but left at around noon. Still huddled together, D and I managed to doze off briefly. The silence was overwhelming. By evening, the sound of the bear's footsteps woke us. When it rammed the tent, I wanted to scream, cry, but I didn't. We held on. I want to go home. Why doesn't it attack us directly? Day 10. The fog is unrelenting. In the afternoon, D stood up silently and walked out of the tent. I didn't stop him. The fog remains unbroken. The bear came late that night. I think I'm losing my mind. Day 11. Today the fog is thick. The bear is here. Day 12. The fog is thick. And that's where the diary entries end. The story doesn't end there, though. Thanks to a submitted climbing plan, authorities knew something was wrong. But the search was delayed by the unprecedented weather. When the fog cleared, the search teams only found an abandoned tent, torn supplies, and this diary. C's body was discovered just 50 meters from that tent, his throat slashed, an instant brutal death. E was found further down the trail, having fallen from a cliff. B was discovered nearly a kilometer away, savaged beyond recognition. D was located at the base of another cliff along the trail. As for A, the diary's author, he was never found. This is a story that I heard from a friend. They said it was once a popular urban legend, like I explained at the beginning, among climbers in Hokkaido. But, according to my friend, there was a real group that was attacked by a bear and wiped out. Unlike the diary's story, they were amateurs who hadn't filled in a climbing plan. Rescue efforts were delayed and all evidence suggested that they tried to retrieve stolen supplies from the bear. A fatal mistake. To anyone exploring Hokkaido's wilderness, beware of bears. This happened about 10 years ago, when I was in my early 20s. Back then, I had just moved from a rural town in Hokkaido to Sapporo to attend medical vocational school. It was my first taste of freedom, living on my own in a small but cozy one-bedroom apartment on the 11th floor of a relatively quiet building. The place was ideal, a corner unit with only one neighbor below and no one either side of me, except the stairwell. The city center and my school were within walking distance, making it incredibly convenient. For a girl who had dealt with her fair share of bullying growing up, this new chapter of independence was thrilling. And while the solitude was refreshing, I wasn't entirely alone. One of my closest friends who lived in the school dorms, would often stay over, and we had an unspoken agreement that my place could double as her escape from dorm life. That said, 
nothing could have prepared me for what happened a few weeks after I moved in. It all began one evening, after a grueling day of clinical practice. Exhausted, I wanted nothing more than a hot shower before collapsing into bed. My apartment's layout meant that the bathroom was directly connected to the hallway, leading from the front door to the living room, so I always made a point to check that the door was locked before undressing. That night, like every other, I checked the door was locked before tossing my clothes in the hallway and stepping into the shower. About five minutes into washing off the day, I heard it. Tadaima. I'm home. It was a woman's voice, calm, matter of fact, and coming from the front door. Half distracted, I immediately assumed it was my friend, so I called back, Okairi, welcome back. But the instant the words left my mouth, something clicked. I hadn't heard the front door open. My apartment's layout made it impossible to miss. Even with the sound of running water, the distinct creak of the door, the rattle of the lock, or even the shuffle of shoes being removed would have been obvious. But there was nothing. Just that single clear greeting. So I froze, my heart was pounding. I shut off the water and I stood there, dripping in silence, listening for any kind of noise. Then I opened the bathroom door a crack and peeked out. I saw nothing but the dimly lit hallway and my clothes on the floor. Gathering my courage, I quickly dried off, dressed, and inspected the entire apartment. Nothing. The front door was still locked, the windows secured, and the place was completely empty and still. Convinced it must have been my imagination or some weird echo from another unit, I brushed it off. That was until it happened again. Every few days, always when I was in the shower, I'd hear the same voice. Tadaima. I'm home. It was never loud, always calm, like someone casually announcing themselves upon their return. At first I ignored it, too scared to respond, but then came the nights when the voice was accompanied by odd disturbances, faint knocking at the windows, the flickering of my computer screen, Random creaks in the walls. The more I stayed silent, the more persistent these disturbances became. It wasn't malicious, but it felt petulant, like someone trying to get my attention. And eventually I caved. Okairi. I started saying whenever I heard the voice. To my surprise, the disturbances stopped. It was as if the acknowledgement was all it wanted. What followed was an odd, almost routine coexistence. Three or four times a week the voice would announce its return and I'd respond in kind and that was it. Nothing else happened and after a while it felt oddly comforting. Living alone had always seemed daunting but now it didn't seem so lonely. My friend joked about my phantom roommate but never heard the voice herself. The presence, or whatever it was, seemed to limit itself to times when I was completely alone. And I have to say, it felt nice to have someone around. Someone who wanted to be there, unlike the company I was forced to endure growing up. One night, curiosity got the better of me, and I spoke out loud to the empty room after hearing the unusual greeting. Are you lonely? I asked softly. I looked all around the room and my eyes met my own when they landed on the mirror. Of course there was no response, just the faint hum of the city outside my window. But after that night I couldn't shake the feeling that whoever or whatever this returning resident was, 
It hadn't meant to scare me. If anything, it seemed as lonely as I had been before moving to Sapporo. The phenomenon continued until I graduated and I moved out of that apartment two years later. On my last night there, as I stood in the empty living room, surrounded by packed boxes, I heard it one final time. Tadaima! This time, my response felt different. A little bittersweet. Okaeri. Sayonara. Since then, I've often wondered about that apartment. Did the next tenant experience the same thing? Was the voice still there, waiting for someone else to come home? Even now, it doesn't feel like a scary memory to me. In fact, it almost feels nostalgic. I like to think that for a brief time, two lonely souls kept each other company in a little apartment high above the bustling streets of Sapporo. If you ever find yourself living on the 11th floor of a quiet corner unit in Sapporo, maybe, you'll hear it too. And if you do, be sure to say, Okairi. The Osarappe River in Hokkaido, Japan is not just a serene body of water winding through the region, it's also steeped in folklore, most notably the legend of the Kappa. These mythical water creatures, infamous in Japan's mythology, are said to dwell in rivers and ponds, often luring humans, especially children, to a watery doom. The Osarappe River in particular has become synonymous with these mischievous and dangerous beings. It's legend passed down through generations. Kappa are often depicted as small humanoid creatures with webbed hands and feet. They are among the most iconic yokai in Japanese folklore. They're typically characterized by their turtle-like shells, green skin, and a dish-like indentation on the top of their heads that holds water. This water is said to be the source of their power. And if it is spilled, they lose their strength. While Kappa are often mischievous, playing tricks on humans or stealing crops, they are also known for their darker tendencies, including drowning people and animals or stealing Shirikodama, a mythical organ said to reside in the anus of their victims. The legend of Osarape River's Kappa dates back centuries to a time where local villagers depended on the river for their livelihood. Fishermen, farmers, and travelers would often recount strange occurrences along the riverbanks, missing livestock, drowned animals, and inexplicable whirlpools which were attributed to the Kappa's mischief. Parents warned their children to stay away from the water spilling tales of Kappa dragging the unwary into the depths. One of the most famous tales involves a young boy from a nearby village. According to the story, the boy was playing near the river when a Kappa emerged from the water and offered him a fish. Fascinated by the strange creature, the boy accepted the gift, only to be dragged towards the river. The boy's quick-thinking dog barked furiously, biting at the Kappa's arm until it released its grip and fled back into the water. Well, the boy survived, but the story became a cautionary tale for generations, warning children of the danger of the river. Over the years, numerous accounts of Kappa sightings near the Osarape River have been documented. These encounters range from fleeting glimpses of strange humanoid figures in the water to more direct interactions. 
One notable account involves a group of fishermen who claim to have caught a kappa in their nets in the early 1900s. They described the creature as small, with scaly green skin, and said that it emitted a high-pitched cry when they brought it aboard. Fearing it would curse them, they quickly released it back into the water, and afterwards, they reported a sudden surge in fish populations, which they attributed to the Kappa's gratitude. Another story from the mid-20th century tells of a farmer who spotted a Kappa stealing his cucumbers from his field. Cucumbers are said to be Kappa's favorite food. The farmer set up traps and claimed to have captured a creature unlike anything he'd ever seen before. Though he never shared what became of it, his family reported strange noises around their home for years, suggesting that the Kappa may have sought revenge. Unlike some Kappa stories which lean heavily into their role as tricksters, the Osorape River's legend continues to carry a note of tragedy. Local folklore tells of a time long ago when the river was dammed by humans, disrupting the Kappa's natural habitat. Many villagers believed that this angered the creatures, leading to an increase in drownings and accidents near the river. A particularly poignant tale involves a Kappa who supposedly fell in love with a human girl. According to the legend, the Kappa would often leave small gifts, cucumbers, fish, and even flowers on the riverbank for the girl to find. When the villagers discovered the Kappa's affections, they feared it would harm her, and they drove it away. The Kappa, heartbroken, was said to have been seen weeping at the river's edge before disappearing into the depths. Afterward, the girl would sit by the river waiting for the Kappa's return, but it never came. Today, the Osarape River's Kappa legend continues to captivate locals and visitors alike. The river and its surrounding areas have become a point of interest for folklore enthusiasts and paranormal investigators. Some local businesses even embrace the legend, offering Kappa-themed goods like cucumber snacks or souvenirs featuring the mythical creature. Despite the playful commercialization, many still approach the river with caution, especially at night. Locals report eerie sounds, splashing water with no visible source, strange cries echoing from the river, and the feeling of being watched. Whether these are tricks of the imagination or genuine encounters with the supernatural, the legend remains alive in the collective consciousness of the region. The Osarape River's Kappa legend is more than just a spooky story. It's a reflection of the relationship between humans and nature. In Hokkaido, where rivers and forests dominate the landscape, tales like this serve as reminders of the power and the mystery of the natural world. They caution against disrespecting the environment and underscore the consequences of disrespecting delicate ecosystems. The Osorape River's Kappa legend endures as a blend of fear, wonder, and reverence. Whether you see the Kappa as a metaphor for the river's dangers, or as actual spirits inhabiting the waters, the story serves as a compelling reminder of the region's rich folklore. For those brave enough to visit Osorape River, the legend lingers in every ripple, whispering of creatures unseen in a world just beyond our grasp. The Sakaimachi Ghost Tunnel in Sapporo, Hokkaido, has earned a notorious reputation as one of Japan's most haunted locations. Known for its unsettling atmosphere 
and the ghost stories that surround it, the tunnel has become a magnet for paranormal enthusiasts and thrill seekers. Unlike other supposedly haunted sites, the legends of Sakae Machi Tunnel have roots in both its eerie design and the chilling experiences reported by countless visitors. Located in Sapporo, Hokkaido's largest city, Sakae Machi Tunnel, was built decades ago as a shortcut connecting neighborhoods. While its functional design may seem unremarkable at first glance, the tunnel's history is less straightforward. Stories of tragic accidents during its construction and fatal car crashes in years since have added layers of sorrow to its existence. Urban legends claim that some of these unfortunate souls never left the tunnel, giving rise to its haunting reputation. The tunnel itself is a narrow, dimly lit passageway, barely wide enough for two cars to pass. Its walls are aged and cracked with water stains that seem to create ghostly shapes. In winter months, Hokkaido's harsh climate only adds to its eerie atmosphere, with snow piling up at the entrances and ice creeping onto the roads. The most famous ghost story associated with the Sakae Machi tunnel is the legend of the woman in white. Drivers passing through at night have reported seeing a pale, ghostly woman standing in the middle of the road, described as wearing a long, white dress and having unkempt black hair. She appears suddenly, forcing drivers to swerve or stop. When they look back, she's either gone or, more horrifying, sitting in the back seat of their car, visible in the rear view mirror. Some accounts suggest that the woman was a victim of a tragic accident in or near the tunnel. The most common tale involves a woman who was hit by a car while walking through the tunnel late at night, left to die in the darkness. Her restless spirit is said to haunt the location, seeking justice or perhaps companionship. Another frequently told story involves phantom footsteps. Pedestrians who dare to walk through the tunnel at night claim to hear the soft but distinct sound of someone walking behind them. When they turn around, no one's there. The tunnel's acoustics make the phenomenon even creepier, as the echoes make it difficult to determine where the sound is coming from. One of the most famous first-hand accounts of the Sakai Machi tunnel involves a local taxi driver. While driving through the tunnel late at night, he reportedly picked up a woman who flagged him down at the entrance. She requested a ride to a nearby address, but when the driver arrived at the destination, the woman was gone, shaken. The driver later learned that the address she gave was linked to a woman who had died years ago. Supposedly the same woman now haunts the tunnel. Similarly, groups of thrill seekers who visit the tunnel at night often report their own terrifying encounters. Some claim that their car engines or headlights malfunction while inside the tunnel, leaving them stranded in total darkness. Others, others have taken photos inside the tunnel only to discover shadowy figures or ghostly faces when they review the images later. There are several theories about why Sakaemachi Tunnel is a hotspot for paranormal activity. The most popular theory ties to the hauntings to the deaths that occurred during the tunnel's construction. Like many infrastructure projects in the early 20th century, worker safety was not a priority, and accidents were common. Some believe that the spirits of those who died during construction are responsible for the eerie happenings. Another theory involves the tunnel's tragic accidents. Over the years, as mentioned, numerous fatal car accidents have occurred at or near the tunnel, often attributed to its poor visibility and slippery roads. Locals claim that these tragedies have added to the tunnel's paranormal energy 
making it a conduit for restless spirits. Despite, or perhaps because of, its haunted reputation, the Sakae Machi Tunnel remains a functioning part of Sapporo's infrastructure. Locals use it daily, though many admit to feeling uneasy while passing through. Some drivers deliberately avoid the tunnel at night, while others make superstitious offerings to ward off bad luck before even entering. For thrill-seekers, the tunnel has become a popular spot for ghost hunting adventures. YouTubers and paranormal investigators often visit, hoping to capture evidence of the supernatural. While some walk away with eerie photos or unexplained audio recordings, others leave disappointed but deeply unsettled by the tunnel's oppressive atmosphere. Just as a word of caution for those considering a visit to Sakae Machi Tunnel, it's important to remember that ghost stories aside, the tunnel can be dangerous. Poor lighting, narrow lanes, and icy conditions in winter make it a challenging drive, even for the most experienced motorists. Paranormal investigators often advise visitors to approach with caution, not just because of the ghostly legends, but because of the real-life hazards. Whether you believe in ghosts or not, Sakae Machi Tunnel has cemented its place in Hokkaido's folklore. The combination of tragic history, creepy stories, and the tunnel's naturally unsettling environment ensures its reputation as one of Japan's most haunted spots. Those who have experienced the tunnel's eerie happenings firsthand often leave with a chilling tale and perhaps a new respect for the mysteries that linger in the shadows of everyday places. It happened one chilly autumn evening during a trip to Hokkaido. The mountains were capped with the season's first snow, and the air was heavy with that quiet, expectant stillness unique to the region. Four of us, co-workers, looking for a weekend escape, had driven into the countryside to enjoy the pristine landscapes and the isolation of the north. As the night deepened, one of us a friend who never missed the chance for a thrill, brought up an idea. Does anyone know any haunted places around here? I feel like scaring myself tonight. The group's energy shifted, while two hesitated, citing the freezing cold and the late hour. I couldn't resist the pull of the suggestion. I'd heard stories about an abandoned hospital in the area, one that had been gutted by a fire years ago and left to crumble. Its charred remains, stark and black against Hokkaido's snow-covered landscapes, were infamous among locals for their ghostly history. We could go there, I suggested. It's creepy, but I've been a couple of times before. And it's safe, or at least as safe as exploring a ruin can be. The thrill-seeker jumped at the idea, but the other two looked uncertain. By the time we arrived... The decision was made. Two would wait in the car, uneasy about the cold and the ominous feel of the place, while I led my braver friend inside. The building loomed before us, its silhouette jagged and skeletal. The faint smell of charred wood still lingered in the icy air, even after all these years. The fire had devoured nearly everything leaving only scorched walls and twisted beams frozen in decay. The contrast between the blackened ruins and the pristine snow around them was unnerving, like the place was untouched by time, yet clearly forgotten. Since we hadn't brought flashlights, since we hadn't brought flashlights, we resorted to using candles purchased at a convenience store. The small flickering flames offered little light, 
but created a strange dancing glow against the soot-streaked walls. As we stepped inside, the silence of the building enveloped us. It wasn't the kind of silence you'd expect in a place this remote. It was heavier, almost alive, as if the walls were holding their breath. We began exploring cautiously, weaving through charred hallways and skeletal rooms. At first, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, just the remains of a tragic fire, frozen in time. But soon, things started to feel off. The layout of the building didn't make any sense, despite knowing the general structure from previous visits, we kept ending up back at the front lobby. First, we went right down a hallway, only to find ourselves looping back to the entrance. Then, we tried a staircase on the left, which should have led us to the upper floors. Instead, it brought us through a door that inexplicably opened back to the lobby. This is weird, my friend muttered, holding the candle higher. You've been here before, right? Does this place always do this? No, I replied, feeling unease creep up my spine. This isn't normal. Still, we pressed on, deciding to try the rooftop. We began climbing a narrow staircase. The wooden steps groaned under our weight. But what made the journey even stranger was how often the candles went out. There was no wind, no drafts, and no movement in the air. But the flames kept spluttering and dying, forcing us to stop repeatedly to relight them. By the time we finally reached the rooftop, the cold had seeped into our bones. But the sight below momentarily distracted us. Our friends still waiting by the car were looking up at us, or so it seemed. We're up here, I shouted, waving a hand. What happened next froze me in place. The two figures below screamed, blood-curdling, primal screams, and bolted back into the car, locking the doors behind them. My friend and I exchanged confused glances. What had scared them? We hurried back down, this time skipping the strange detours, though the staircase still took longer to descend than it should have. We reached the car, and found our friends pale and shaking, tears streaming down one of their faces. What happened? What did you see? I asked, but it took several minutes before either could speak properly or coherently. Finally, one of them managed to explain. We saw you, both of you, three times. What? You went in through the front, right? First, we saw you turn right and disappear into the hallway. Then a few minutes later, you walked by the lobby again, heading left, but then you came back again a third time. We called out to you, but you didn't answer properly. You just went upstairs. My heart sank. My friend beside me looked just as shaken. We had only passed through the lobby twice. And then, the other friend added, you, whatever it was that looked like you, went to the roof, but it couldn't have been you. Not really, because right after... We heard you shouting down at us. Their voices broke with panic. And that's when we heard it. A faint, almost whispering voice. Close, but not close enough to pinpoint. Coming from the charred ruins behind us. All four of us froze. The voice was unmistakably real. Even though it seemed to come from nowhere. Slowly my gaze lifted back to the roof. A flicker of light. Two small candle flames danced across the blackened sky and standing just beyond them, illuminated faintly by their glow, were two figures. Their faces were obscured despite the light, but their shapes were unmistakable. We didn't stick around to find out more. Without another word, we piled into the car and sped away, leaving the ruins of the hotel and whatever else might have been there far behind. To this day, none of us can explain what happened. But every now and then, when I think about that night, I feel a chill deeper than any Hokkaido winter. It's the kind of cold that even fire can't chase away.
Okay, so this happened a few years ago, back when I was stationed at a garrison in Hokkaido for work. For context, Hokkaido is known for its vast landscapes, brutal winters, and apparently, and apparently, some seriously creepy stories. I've always been a skeptic, but what I experienced during my time there still gives me chills when I think about it. So one day, I was assigned to guard duty. This wasn't with my usual unit. It was a mix of guys from different units. We all barely knew each other, so the vibe was a bit awkward. The day shift went by uneventfully, and soon enough, it was time for the night shift. By midnight, the whole garrison was dead quiet. You could hear the wind outside, and occasionally, the creak of old wooden doors that didn't quite close properly. It was one of those eerie nights. While we were trying to stay awake, one of the younger guys, let's call him Yamai, suddenly said, I'm leaving when my term's up. I'm done with this place. And that sparked a conversation, and despite the late hour, we all started talking about and despite the late hour, we all started sharing stories about why we joined or things we'd experienced since enlisting. Then Yamai dropped a bombshell. When I first got stationed here, I went through something seriously messed up, he said. His tone got all quiet, and the rest of us leaned in. He told us about when he first arrived at the base. He was shown to his barracks and assigned a bed. Now picture this, the whole room was lined with single beds, but the bed he was assigned to was the only bunk bed in the entire room, and it stuck out like a sore thumb. At first, he didn't think much of it. He figured maybe someone else had been using the bottom bunk and would be back soon. But then his superior specifically told him, You sleep on the top. Weird, right? He asked if he could use the bottom bunk instead, because why not? It was empty, but the answer was always the same. No, use the top bunk. He started to think the odd bed was some kind of hazing thing, but it didn't really bother him. He decided he would sleep on the bottom bunk, since no one was using it. He didn't really like climbing up that creaky metal ladder at night when his roommates were sleeping anyway. A few weeks after he'd settled in, he woke up in the middle of the night struggling to breathe he said it felt like someone was pressing down on his chest and his neck, and for a second, he thought it was sleep paralysis. But then he noticed something stranger. There was someone stood right next to his bed. At first, he thought it was one of the other guys messing with him. But as his eyes adjusted to the dim light, he realized that the figure wasn't normal. It was just a black silhouette. No face. No features, just this dark, dense shadow. And then it moved closer. Before he could react, it leaned over him and started pressing down on his neck. That's when it spoke in this soft, gravelly voice that seemed to boom in his mind. It said, I did everything you wanted me to. The voice wasn't angry. It sounded sad, like somehow heartbroken. Yamai panicked and tried to shout, but no sound came out. He was thrashing around, trying to shake it off, when he managed to croak out, What are you talking about? The figure didn't answer right away. Instead, it pressed harder and whispered, Why didn't you help me? And then, just as suddenly as it appeared, it vanished, and the pressure on his neck was gone. He shot up in bed, gasping for air. He was drenched in sweat, and for a second, he thought maybe... It was just a nightmare, but his neck felt sore, like someone had actually been gripping it. The next day, Yamai asked his roommates about his bed. Nobody wanted to talk about it. They all avoided eye contact and told him to just leave it alone. Eventually, an older guy from another room pulled him aside and told him the truth. Apparently, about six months before Yamai got there, a soldier who had been assigned to that bed had jumped off the ferry between Hokkaido and Honshu. Rumor was, he had been dealing with a bad breakup and couldn't handle it anymore. The guy had been quiet, but something about his death didn't sit right with those who knew him. After his death, strange things started happening in the barracks. 
People heard footsteps around the bed, saw shadows out of the corner of their eyes, and even felt someone sitting on the bed when no one was there. It got so bad that the bunk bed was brought in as some kind of barrier with the idea that no one would sleep on the bottom bunk. Yamai finished his story by saying, I never saw the shadow again, but I switched rooms not long after. I didn't care if it made me look weak in front of the others. I wasn't staying in that bed. We all sat there in silence. The next day, I walked by that barracks and, sure enough, there was a lone bunk bed in a row of singles. I had one question for Yamai. Why didn't they just throw the bed out? He told me that they tried. And until it was put back where it was supposed to be in the exact place, paranormal activity ramped up like crazy. I never asked him anything else about it again. But every time I passed that room, I got this weird feeling because of his story. Just looking at the bed alone gave me the creeps. <laughs>